Okay, so I want to quickly go through uh, two, we're going to have two parts to this. This is the digestive system, it's mainly chapter 21, and uh, it's got to be kind of divided into two sections because we're going to get through about the small intestine. We're going to work our way through the mouth and then down through the, uh, uh, into the, into the, and more or less out of the small intestine. So um, first of all, uh, since this is the digestive system, we're going to talk about function. So what is the overall function of the di digestive system? This is kind of right out of the book. It's uh, ingestion. You have to take the food and put it in the mouth. And then mastication, which is the word we use for chewing. Okay, And that's going to increase the surface area so it can be broken down with, um, with enzymes. And, that's a, uh, and chewing is a uh, mechanical uh, method. So we're going to talk about we're going to talk about that mechanical versus chemical, and just about every part of the digestive system does both. So you might want to keep that in mind. Uh, I don't mean to have trick questions, but you know, mechanical digestion happens all the way through as well as chemical. Uh, okay, so uh, propulsion and mixing. So we'll talk about what that means. That comes down to things like peristalsis and segmentation, and then secretion. So mucus is secreted everywhere along the entire gastrointestinal tract, okay, that big tube that runs through you. Mucus is secreted the whole way through. Uh, there's water to uh, sort of liquefy and keep it, keep it uh, liquid as it moves through, and then enzymes. So we have enzymes that are being produced, and different enzymes are being produced in different places, and that's something you're going to have to keep straight. Uh, we'll talk about bile and what bile is. Uh, bile is released by the liver, so keep that in mind as well. That's a very important point. And then enzymes for chemical digestion. Okay, so we already discussed mechanical versus chemical. And then absorption. So absorption takes place, it says here, not regulated. Absorption takes place no matter what. If you put food into your digestive tract, um, there are always... Uh, channels and pumps and things like that that are ready to absorb that and take it into the body. Okay, and then elimination. So elimination of, pro of products from the body, and that comes out as feces, and that term is defecation. Okay, so <clears throat> essentially our digestive system is a long tube. So if we look at this, this is simply a long tube that goes all the way through the body and then out the other end. So if you think of it like this is a donut, so pretend this is a donut. So a donut has a hole in the middle. So if something moves around the outside, you wouldn't say that's in the donut. And if something moves through the middle, you wouldn't say that's in the donut. So when something is ingested, it has to be absorbed. Otherwise, it is technically technically still outside the body. Yes, it's a tube, but in the same way that this donut hole is still outside the donut, this is still outside the body. So if you swallow a marble or a quarter, or if a kid does, um, that thing will pass all the way through and never enter technically the body, okay? It won't be absorbed, all right? So uh, mechanically and enzymatically breaks things down. So this is happening the entire way. And when we look at uh, this tube, we see that there's a stomach here that kind of, there's a, there's a sphincter muscle here that will hold food in there and some digestion takes place uh, chemically and mechanically. The stomach helps to grind things up a little more. And then, uh, and then it just sort of moves through slowly. It just lets out a little bit at a time. And, uh, and lets it move through. And most of your digestion, another thing that's very important, most of your digestion actually happens in the small intestine. Okay. All right. So primarily it keeps what it needs and then the rest, if it decides that it doesn't need it or if there isn't a channel or some way to absorb it, it just moves right on through. Okay. So along with some other waste, mostly from the liver, the liver also uh, will add stuff to it. I shouldn't point to the esophagus. It actually adds it to the duodenum or the first part of the intestine. It just dumps it along with bile and we'll talk about what bile is. So when we when we think about what we eat, all food is or was part of something living, which means that it has carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and then I always include this one, nucleic acids. And the reason is because we have enzymes for all of these things, okay? So we have enzymes that will break down all of these things individually. So we have enzymes that break down carbohydrates, some that break down fats. We call these lipases, proteases. 
uh, for proteins and then nucleases for uh, nucleic acids. Usually for carbohydrates, it gets the term amylase. So we have pancreatic amylase, then we have salivary amylase. So uh, we'll go through all those. So these have to be broken down to their simplest form. Okay, so that means a big long protein chain will ultimately really be broken down into individual amino acids. Okay, so that's the simplest form. Fats like triglycerides will ultimately be broken down into individual fatty acids and maybe a monoglyceride. Uh, but they're broken down all the way because we don't want anything functional. We don't want anything from a different organism to functionally move in and do something in our body. We try to we try to avoid that. So we also avoid vitamins or absorb. We also absorb vitamins, uh, minerals, which are things like sodium, potassium, and we know what those things are good for. They're electrolytes and they're for depolarization, repolarization, muscle function, uh, buffers, lots of lots of different things. Building building bones, second messenger systems, calcium does a whole lot of stuff. Okay. And then we can't avoid this, random molecules. Some, some are good and some are bad. Uh, drugs, drugs fall into that category. But then so do toxins. So sometimes the body absorbs things uh, that can either be beneficial or they can be, or they can be toxic. And usually uh, those are eliminated very quickly in the, uh, in the renal system. Okay, so the digestive tract uh, includes the mouth through the anus. And the GI tract refers to the stomach and all of the intestines. But that's, in general, the digestive tract is that tube, okay? But we also know there are things like the liver that are involved in digestion, the pancreas, the gallbladder, and then there are a number of glands as well. And these are accessory organs, okay? So keep that straight. Accessory organs are anything that are not part of this tract, not part of this tube that runs through you. Okay, so we're going to go back and we're going to talk about what each one of these things does. Glands we won't really talk about. We'll just say that these glands are uh, secreting enzymes. They secrete mucus. We'll talk about them a little bit. Okay. All right. So let's think about, I guess since we're talking about, since we're talking about glands, we can, uh, we can look at some of these layers of the digestive tract. And it's important to remember that there is a muscle layer, okay? So muscle kind of goes through the entire digestive tract because it has to move things. Things have to be, things have to be pushed through. And then like that segmentation that I sort of talked about earlier, um, things have to be moved around in there. And if you have that, you have to have innervation, okay? So we can see that it's innervated, and that mainly stays up here in the in the outer layer, in the muscularis layer. Uh, the serosa layer is this is this even further outer layer that is joined with this mesentery, and this mesentery kind of holds everything in place. This is why your your intestines don't just droop all down to the bottom. Uh, because they're actually being held in place, but that gives a blood supply. Now, most of the blood vessels and connective tissue are in this layer, this this mucosa and submucosa layer. Okay, so you can see this here, the submucosa. So this is the submucosa, and you can see it has all of these blood vessels running through it. Um, there are some glands and some ducts that are secreting usually mucus so we have mucus uh, cells that are that are being secreted in there uh, serous cells so the serous layer is also secreting secreting lubricant around around this area as well to keep it uh, so things can move around and uh, so that keeps it lubricated and then there are special cells called goblet cells and these goblet cells are called that because they're kind of shaped like a goblet okay so, so they're kind of shaped like that, okay? So if you look at them, they, somebody said that they, they looked like a goblet, so they call those goblet cells, okay? But those are, those are the main layers, and just remember that they're innervated. They're, the submucosal layer has a, has a lot of uh, blood vessels that, that connect it and are, and are supplying blood flow to these, to these other layers. Um, yeah, okay. All right, so let's talk about peristalsis and segmentation. Two different things. Peristalsis will keep it moving forward, okay? So we call this a bolus. So 
it's it's kind of confusing not really but when you eat food food is food and then you sort of put it into a chunk of food which we call a bolus starting out so that's just a chunk of food and then later on we'll see that when that starts mixing with water and enzymes and mucus and stuff like that we start to call it chyme okay so that's just because it's really we really can't call it food anymore uh, a bolus is just a chunk of something you get like a bolus injection and that means that you get all of the medication at one time so if you give a bolus injection then you would squirt out all of that at one time as opposed to an IV which kind of comes out as a drip or something okay so that's how you remember the term bolus it's just a it's just a chunk of stuff um, but peristalsis will move that bolus forward okay so this happens in the this happens all through the uh, gastrointestinal system uh, this movement of a chunk it put, sort of puts it into a chunk and moves it forward segmentation does the opposite it takes this bolus and it kind of mixes it okay because because ultimately this if we say this is the intestine it's secreting enzymes okay and you don't just want this the enzymes to have access to the outside part of this chunk of food or this bolus so you have to mix it and then the enzymes can mix with the food and then you have it has more access to to these nutrients to, to help break them down okay so so usually what you have is you have a bolus that moves forward and then you have some segmentation where it kind of shifts it back and forth and mixes it a little bit and then it'll form another bolus and it'll move it forward and then mixes it and then moves it forward and it does this the entire the entire way through your uh, through your intestines primarily okay so let's say we ate something well, we know the first thing we do is chew it, and that's mastication. Okay, so we have different different types of teeth. We have uh, incisors, canines, uh, and you can see uh, some of those—the canines that are here and the incisors that are that are really used for uh, used for cutting. Okay, the incisors are used for cutting, and then we have the molars back here in the back that are used for grinding. And the purpose of this is to increase surface area okay so if you think of uh, eating like a uh, I don't know like a jawbreaker or something like that some hard piece of candy it takes a lot longer to digest that if you swallow it whole okay because then your enzymes really only have access to the outside okay meanwhile if you break it up into little pieces then the enzymes have lots more access okay so they can kind of hit it from all angles and hit these smaller pieces and that that increase in surface area really helps in digestion so uh, chewing is you know the first it's uh, mechanical but it's the first real digestion that that takes place I mean it's a it's a it's a big change from that carrot that you ate that was a full carrot uh, to the mush that you end up with after you chew it up okay so saliva we all know about saliva um, saliva does a lot of things prevents bacterial infections it's got a lot of uh, immune types of cells lubrication uh, it helps form the bolus so if you eat something like a piece of cake that tends to be a little bit more dry uh, then you can mix that with saliva and you're able to form that bolus you're able to kind of put that into a chunk push it to the back of your throat and then you have deglutition or swallowing uh, so you so you're able to swallow that it has buffers to keep it around a neutral pH okay so uh, something that is is a little different in pH a lot of citrus is very acidic it'll mix with the saliva and that gives it a little more of a friendly pH and that's kind of important because enzymes particularly one active enzyme is produced that works best at around a neutral pH and that's salivary amylase okay salivary amylase breaks down starches and starches are a type of carbohydrate so they fit into that category okay so starches are a car carbohydrate and salivary amylase is the enzyme that breaks those down it takes a long chain so a, a starch is just a long chain primarily of glucose molecules kind of like glycogen but it's starch and it will and what the the amylase does is it cuts this okay so it'll cut these and it'll turn them into smaller like disaccharides trisaccharides things like that 
Okay, so those are a little bit easier to digest later on where they're again broken down in the small intestine. Okay, now there's one other interesting thing that happens, and this is with something called lingual lipase. Okay, remember one of those other biomolecules were lipids, so guess what a lipase does? It's an enzyme that breaks down lipids. Okay, but here's the thing it doesn't work in the mouth. Okay, it's made in saliva, or it's made and then put in saliva, but it functions at a pH of about 1 or 2. So it functions in the low pH of stomach. It does not function in the mouth, okay? So it's made in the mouth, but activated by the low pH of the stomach or the stomach acid, okay? So remember this. You'll probably be asked that. The only thing that's really enzymatically broken down, this is the chemical part of digestion that happens in your mouth, is this salivary amylase, okay? You make lingual lipase, but it's not active until it gets to the stomach, okay? All right, so deglutition, that's the fancy word for swallowing. Uh, it actually happens in three phases. So we know that we can start swallowing, and so we move this bolus of food, or this chunk of food, to the back of the, back of the mouth, okay, back to the pharynx, which is the throat area, which is this area back here. Um, that's the bolus area, okay. So uh, so we move that food back there, and then and then we have this pharyngeal reflex. So we can start the swallowing process, but then uh, but then this the uh, the esophagus is opened up. This stuff is all pretty automatic, okay. So the epiglottis. Uh, blocks the trachea, so that moves down so food doesn't go in. Uh, you have the uvula, which moves up to sort of block the nasal passage. So all you have is one path that will go straight through to the esophagus. The trachea, so this is the esophagus here, the trachea is blocked off, okay? So there's no entrance into the trachea. This, your nasal passage is blocked off. So what you've got, ultimately, is when you're regu when you're breathing normally, this is all opened up. Your your trachea air can move down to your trachea. It can move from the mouth. All of this is opened up. But when you swallow, you make a very solid pathway where food can only go this way. So you block off the trachea. You block off the nasal passage, and then food will simply go down. The esophagus and then you have the esophageal reflex which is peristalsis so you have the peristaltic movements or these wave-like movements that are pushing food this way okay so it's so it's kind of it keeps pushing down so these so the muscles are kind of slinking along kind of like a snake and then just pushing continually this way okay so then as food approaches the stomach, the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes and opens, and so we get to the stomach. So this is the lower es esophageal sphincter. This is the one people have problems. It's a sphincter muscle, okay, which means that it's circular and it sort of squeezes off, okay? So that's supposed to be closed most of the time. Some people have a weak lower esophageal sphincter, and it tends to sometimes leak the contents back. And hydrochloric acid is one of the main con uh, uh, substances that is made in the stomach, okay? So, so this fluid that's in the stomach is very, very acidic, okay? And so, uh, so that means that if this lower esophageal sphincter is a little bit weak, then the hydrochloric acid can move back up, and it, will, it can damage the, uh, the esophagus. Now, the stomach is lined very thickly with a thick layer of mucus, so it's supposed to be protective. It's made to handle this harsh hydrochloric acid environment, uh, but the esophagus uh, isn't always, okay? So it's, it's not as, it's not as uh, rugged against the, uh, against the dangers of the uh, hydrochloric acid, okay? So... Um, so the pyloric sphincter is down here, and that's going to let food out. So a little at a time. So food moves in, and the stomach will, you can see that there's some motility. 
that the stomach is actually grinding and this is why our stomach growls sometimes when your stomach is a little bit empty some air will be in there and as your stomach is kind of grinding uh, it will let some of that air go by and it'll come up as bubbles and we and we hear that as it's moving around to different parts okay and then after a while after a certain amount of digestion then the pyloric sphincter will open and then close and open and close and it just sort of lets food out a little a little bit at a time okay so let's talk about something very important this is one of the more difficult things is to remember that okay I'm going to say right now that really only two things are broken down in the stomach and that is those are proteins and lipids okay so if you recall in saliva it was carbs but not in the stomach okay the stomach breaks down proteins and lipids and it does this when you have the presence of food or the presence of um, of proteins or something like that you have these cells in there called G cells and they release a hormone called gastrin okay so the gastrin will go out it's a hormone so that means it's being carried through the blood and it'll go to all of these other there are other cells in there called endochromaffin like or ECL cells and those cells are line the stomach so if we if we look at the way the stomach is it's kind of shaped like it's kind of like this and we have all of these different cell types this is the ECL cell uh, parietal cells that we'll talk about and then chief cells here and then we have mucus cells that are secreting mucus okay so we have all of these different cells that are lined up and in in various places along the surface of the stomach so when food enters it releases a hormone called gastrin and that's that's fine uh, gastrin then activates ECL cells ECL cells release histamine now you've often heard that uh, some people that take antihistamines have stomach problems well that's because it blocks these ECL cells from being able to uh, respond to to histamine uh, or actually it blocks the parietal cells from being able to respond to histamine the ECL cells will still release it but if you take an antihistamine then the histamine is supposed to be activating parietal cells so the histamine that's released from these will go down and bind these parietal cells or receptors on them and that'll tell the parietal cells to release hydrochloric acid so acid is being released uh, and actually there are certain antihistamines they played around with this for a while to have antihistamines that would actually reduce acid and it makes sense okay so G cells are activated first they tell these ECL cells to release histamine histamine then goes on to activate parietal cells okay so parietal cells those are the ones that are listed here okay so we see those there and then the parietal cells release the hydrochloric acid they also release something called intrinsic factor now intrinsic factor is a protein that binds to vitamin b12 okay so v12 vitamin and it will allow vitamin b12 to be absorbed through the stomach and the intestines okay so that's what that's what intrinsic factor does so if you don't have intrinsic factor then you don't absorb vitamin b12 and this is actually a problem for if you've ever heard of people needing b12 injections usually it happens in older people there are also some autoimmune disorders that can that can destroy your intrinsic factor uh, but a lot of times in older people they'll stop making intrinsic factor and when they stop making intrinsic factor even if they're getting enough b12 in their diet they may not be able to absorb it and so a lot of times they'll have to make take supplemental to just get an extreme amount of b12 or they have to take an injection now once the inside of the stomach becomes acidic with hydrochloric acid remember that was made by parietal cells okay that will activate something called chief cells okay and chief cells release pepsinogen okay and pepsinogen is not active okay it's going to break down proteins but it's not active immediately it has to actually make its way 
through. So if it's released here, you may have a layer of mucus. Okay, you may have a layer of mucus here. So we can say that pepsinogen is being, let's see, do we have chief cells on here? Pepsinogen is being released by these chief cells, but pepsinogen isn't active. <clears throat> and it's not active until it moves out through the mucus layer and it gets actually out here where the hydrochloric acid is. And then it becomes pepsin. And pepsin is the active enzyme. Okay, so I know this is a lot to remember. G cells release gastrin. That's the thing that starts it pretty much. And then uh, gastrin activates the ECL or endochromophin-like cells. That which release histamine. Histamine activates parietal cells. Parietal cells release, we'll take the X's off of the intrinsic factor, parietal cells release hydrochloric acid an intrinsic factor, and then that acid environment will activate chief cells, and chief cells will ultimately cause pepsin to be released. Okay, so do you remember before? Okay, so that means that so what digestion takes place in the stomach? Well, we just mentioned pepsin, okay, and pepsin digests proteins. Okay, breaks them down into their individual amino acids. Okay, so um, so that that happens, and so we've already sort of covered that. Um, the hydrochloric acid. Remember, proteins are just are three dimensional, and usually their their shape always their shape is very important for their function. But the trouble is, in the hydrochloric acid, they unfold. So now it's no longer functional, which is really good if you're eating something that has proteins that maybe you don't want them to be active inside you. So the hydrochloric acid will actually denature them, and then in the stomach anyway, this pepsin can cut can cut them. Uh, in the small intestine, we'll see things like trypsin, which is also a protease, chemotrypsin, and those trypsin. I think I'm spelling that wrong. Uh, and those will also break down proteins, but the, the but the step is started with pepsin in the stomach. Okay, so that's the one that does it in the stomach. All right, and it was released, remember, by chief cells. Lipids, remember lingual lipase, okay? Remember the lingual lipase that was made in the mouth, and I don't have it here, um, but there's also something called gastric lipase that the stomach actually makes. Gastric lipase, and that's, that's, a, that's a good name because it says gastric right in it, and gastric usually refers to the stomach. Okay, so lingual lipase that was made in the mouth and then activated by the stomach acid. Okay, not very many proteins like to be in acidic environments, but these have are made for this purpose. Okay, and then gastric lipase, and these break down lipids. So really, the only digestion, chemical digestion, that takes place in the stomach are proteins and lipids. Okay, carbohydrates no significant digestion of carbohydrates. That salivary amylase, amylase that we made in the sal saliva to break down starches doesn't work in the stomach acid, okay? It liked that neutral pH. And so once you swallow, it doesn't work anymore, okay? So, so no significant digestion of carbohydrates. These are it. And there's almost always a question about that. What chemical digestion takes place in the stomach? It's just proteins and lipids. Okay, so interestingly, Carbohydrates will move through the stomach first, and then proteins will move through next, and then lipids will usually stay for the longest period of time in the stomach. That's a lot of times why, you know, for breakfast or something like that, if you eat something with a lot of protein and fat, like, you know, bacon and eggs or, or something, that's why traditionally, or maybe that's why, uh, traditionally a lot of breakfast foods tend to be a little heavier on the fatty side, bacon. Um, because because it might it might last a little longer okay all right um, and it also helps you recover from from being from being starved all night all right so um, in the small intestine so now we have a new name so we talked about this bolus of food that that went from your from your oral cavity down to the stomach and now it's mixing with different with different enzymes and stuff so this is the small intestine kind of going the wrong way with it, um, but it, we should go this way with it, small intestine, and then we start to call it, 
chyme. Okay, so now, I mean, again, it goes back to we can't call it food, so we give it the name chyme, and that's, uh, that's food chewed up, mixed with fluids, mixed with um, enzymes and stuff like that, so we call that chyme. So chyme will move from the stomach to that pyloric sphincter just a little bit at a time. So it opens up for a little while, and then it closes, and then it opens, and then it closes, and there's constant feedback. It's, it knows if there's food on the other side, and that will send a signal saying, hey, okay, release a little more, and little by little, it'll let that, let that through. Okay, so it moves through the pyloric sphincter and into the small intestine. The small intestine, big, important, bolded right here, site of the greatest amount of digestion and absorption of nutrients and water. Okay, so, so that's where most of the stuff takes place. That's where most of your digestion takes place. So remember, in the stomach, we only saw proteins and lipids being digested enzymatically okay mechanically it was all happening but only proteins and lipids were in the stomach here we have all of them so we have so in the small intestine we have lipids proteins um, nucleic acids and carbohydrates carbs and nucleic acids are just DNA and RNA which are you know that those are in most foods as well uh, anything that was anything that's alive has nucleic acids RNA and DNA so those have to be broken down so everything can be broken down in the small intestine and it's I don't I don't think let's see we're not really covering anatomy but these are but these are the three divisions of the small intestine the duodenum which is where most of this happens okay so most of the Digestive enzymes are, are secreted into the duodenum, um, and then the next part is the jejunum and the ileum. And it's and you know the small intestine tends to be you know very very long, 2.5 meters, 3.5 meters for for the ileum. So that's you know that's uh, what is it nine 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 eighteen? It's about 20 almost 20 feet according according to uh, to this calculation. So it's about three feet in a meter. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's quite a bit because this is about six meters. Six times three is eighteen. So yeah, that's a uh, it's got a long ways to go. So it's got a lot of time to sort of move stuff back and forth and push it through and uh, and expose it to all of those uh, enzymes. Okay, so when food moves into the duodenum, accessory organs are activated. Now here is another enzymes. I know you learned a lot of them, hormones and enzymes. There's another hormone that gets secreted because remember this, the low pH. This was very, very acidic. You don't want a low pH here. Once you move into the duodenum, once you move into the small intestine, you want your pH to go up closer to neutral okay so as soon as chyme moves into the small intestine this will stimulate the release of a hormone called secretin okay that's nice secrete and that secretin will actually so secretin is a hormone so it moves into the bloodstream and then the blood that will actually activate the pancreas Okay, keeping this straight, low pH triggers the release of secretin. Secretin's a hormone, so it moves into the blood. It causes the pancreas to produce bicarbonate, which will raise the pH. Okay, so that's one of the important things that uh, that's released from the uh, from the small intestine. Now. The presence of primarily fats, actually, it says here fats and proteins, which is true, but primarily fats will stimulate another hormone called cholecystokinin, or CCK. Now, there are a lot of studies of because, um, because CCK, actually, in addition to its role in stimulating the release of enzymes from the pancreas, and bile from the liver and the gallbladder. So it's activating these accessory uh, organs. But it also kind of makes you feel full, okay? So cholecystokinin will make you feel full. So it, it stimulates the pancreas, yes, but really 
the important thing about CCK and what would probably be on a test is that the CCK it's detecting okay so here it is so if we come through we let some of the chyme out it's low pH it detects fats and it says oh there's fat in this and so this is just showing it activating the pancreas but it will also activate the gallbladder and the liver and I know we haven't really talked about what those are but that's what it, it will activate these and then that will produce bile and bile salts that are in the bile will uh, will help to break down fats okay and it also gives you that feeling of being full okay so um, so really quickly we'll talk about the pancreatic uh, secretions and then we'll have to uh, pause this and come back for the next part but uh, pancreatic secretions so when activated, the pancreas raises the pH by releasing bicarbonate. So we mentioned that, that HCO3 minus, into the first part of the, the small intestine or the duodenum. Okay. It also, okay, pancreatic, and it's called pancreatic juice. Okay. That's an odd name, but uh, that's what it's called. So it releases this pancreatic juice, which has enzymes to break down proteins. Now, these enzymes they're all they're all really referred to as proteases because they break down proteins the thing is they all do it a little bit different places remember we have 20 different amino acids that come together to make a protein and so trypsin so trypsinogen that's the inactive form and then it's it's uh it's activated to trypsin chemotrypsinogen is activated to chemotrypsin and procarboxypeptidases is uh is activated to carboxypeptidase. Um, but let's just look at trypsin and chemotrypsin. What they do is they break it down between different enzymes. So trypsin may break it down between those enzymes, whatever they are, and chemotrypsin might break it down between whatever these enzymes are. And so together with, with several different proteases, we end up with just one or two amino acids, and that's it. So proteins are broken down very, very tiny, basically trying to break them down into individual amino acids. And sometimes it takes several uh, different proteins to do that because they, they are, they're very specific. Like one might only break it down between a proline and a valine, or, you know, to, to name a couple of amino acids. Um, so uh, that's important. Now, amylase we mentioned salivary amylase well now we have pancreatic amylase and of course that's breaking down carbohydrates and then various lipases will break down lipids and then deoxy and and ribonucleases will break down nucleic acids okay so uh, i think we've mentioned that uh, the pancreas has this uh, one percent endocrine function the alpha cells and the beta cells that are releasing insulin and glucagon to help control blood sugar however 99 percent of the function of the pancreas is to is exocrine so that means that it's secreting digestive enzymes and so that's what we're talking about okay so next we're going to come back and we're going to keep going in the small intestine but we're going to start talking about the liver and the gallbladder okay